Across the country. Something is definitely changing in the Middle East. There's something changing when it comes to the nature of Islamism. The Islamic Republic of Iran or the Islamic occupiers of Iran, by keep pushing the agenda and manipulation, they failed to completely win the argument in Iran. The Iranians and the Persians and all the others have, have a rich history and culture before this Islamic coup that happened in 1979. And now we are seeing the result of it. Young people, younger generation are definitely moving away from Islam and Islamism, but they are either becoming Christians or maybe even like secular or atheists, whatever. But Christianity is definitely on the rise. 50,000 mosques have closed in Iran. That was the initial update we had a couple of months ago. Are Ira Iranians seeking truth outside of Islam? But we've also heard all these updates saying how Iran has now become a hotspot for Christianity. This is absolutely fascinating. Do not forget the history of Iran and Persian Empire and all the others. When Cyrus the Great freed the Jews from Babylon, when they fought against Islamism, when they refused to convert, and of course they had to conquer. We had uh, Muhammad and his uh, people uh, literally in a bloody way uh, come to take over the land. Yet they still didn't manage to destroy the culture and heritage. They might have been taken over. The regime could be Islamic, but the people are not. We also had the, already the existing data that we talked to you guys about two, three years ago on this channel, before the rise of Christianity, that the actual official data coming from the Islamic world showed that less than, fewer than 35% of Iranians are uh, practicing in Islam. Less than 35%. But of course, the rest of the world see the Islamic Republic's flag thinking everybody is doing Islamism in Iran. It's not true. It's never been true. Iran, the world's fastest growing church. In the past two decades, Iran has had the fastest growing church in the world, even uh, though the Bible is illegal, points out Nima Alizadeh, one of the many Iranians converts to Christianity in the last couple of decades. Iranians like Nima uh, are taught uh, the ways of Islam from the day they are born. There is no God but Allah, apparently. Uh, the Mah Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, and he is the last and final prophet sent by Allah. Nima was no exception to this rule. Growing up in a nominal Muslim family who preached that, that Islam was the only religion, there was no other option. Things are changing. The tide is turning. Good news from Iran. A million new Christian believers. What, for, what first comes to, into your mind when you see the word Iran in the headlines? Well, people always assume the Islamic Republic. But it's not true. We know it's not true. Amid hijab protest, uh, Christianity expands foothold in Iran, according to two other new experts as well who've been talking about this a lot. This is the beginning of change when it comes to the saving humanity. While Europe and the, the continent of Europe is being taken over by Islamists and those with barbaric views and backwards views, there is still a beacon of hope. Israel and Israelis are fighting against Islamism. We still have some countries in Europe, Poland and Hungary, fighting against it, mostly Poland actually. But in the Middle East, it's not just Israel. Iran is also the beacon of hope. Not just a personal story. My story is repeated by millions of people. This journey I had. Yeah, that's, and that's what's so interesting yeah. to me is that uh, you're one of some of the first fruits, I would say, of what God began to do. But but it really has become millions and millions of Iranians right. leaving Islam, coming to faith in Jesus Christ, um, and and changing a, a culture After inside. After 1,400 of years of Islamic philosophy, thinking, and cultural fabric, the only way, you know, a lot of people think, oh, if, if we do a political struggle or, or military action, we're going to change a country. Yeah, you may change a government but you're not gonna change the people. So how do you make that change? Change their theology, change their theology, change their theology. Welcome to the show, I'm so glad you're here. And today I'm actually gonna be talking with uh, my friend Ed Solly from Canada because we are in his studios in the greater Toronto area. And today we're gonna to be talking about the struggle of Muslims who convert to Christianity from within a Muslim context. I mean, right now, as we're speaking, uh, this kind of thing is being beamed into the, the Middle Eastern Muslim world. 
And uh, that is just so powerful. And so we're so glad to have that relationship with you and uh, such an incredible thing. So <clears throat> your, your father, Fred Solly, um, he originally became a Christian in Iran, right? That's right. Is that right? That's right. And then uh, through a series of, of events, that's a very exciting story. He, he got to Canada and, and your whole family are Christians now. Yes. And you now serve as an elder at a church, the Church on the Rock, that has a number of people who are Muslims who've converted right. to Christianity. And so there are some amazing stories that I've heard. Um, people may not realize that the, the media may try to act like this isn't quite the way it is, but it is quite dangerous or can be quite dangerous, can't it? For Absolutely. someone who converts to Christianity or possesses some Bibles or some, or has a house church. That's a scary situation. So uh, talk a little bit about that. What kind of amazing stories do we have? Well, you're absolutely right. Uh, the repression that is happening today in some of these countries like Iran, uh, we only read about them in, in stories by Alexander Solzhenitsyn in Soviet Union. And we, we think that these are just old stories and fantasies, but they're real. They're happening right now as mm. we speak. Uh, and if you're a Christian or you become a Christian, you, uh, you put your life at risk of uh, the very least to be arrested, to be severely and harshly interrogated, to be given uh, warnings, to lose your job, to lose your status, your social benefits, your family becoming a target of harassment, uh, that would be the least. And then, of course, uh, there would be mock trials and uh, trials that would end up in imprisonment, uh, long prisons, uh, terms are given, you know, at the least would be seven to ten years. Uh, and these prisons are no Hotel California where people can sit there and have three meals a day and read a book. They are very tough places to be. And then, of course, some have been executed as well. So in light of that, to be a Christian and to practice your faith is extremely difficult. People have to go through so much and pay such a heavy price to confess Christ. And you would ask yourself, well, why would they do something like that? You know, uh, why would they go through all that? Uh, because they have experienced something that they cannot deny anymore. They must maintain it, retain it, and share it with other people. So we have stories of people that have, uh, you know, all kinds of things have happened to them, either supernatural, uh, I would call it supernatural because I have no other word to describe, uh, encounters with Christ. I, I'm pretty sure it is Christ that they've encountered uh, because I know through church history, whenever the Christian community has been under, uh, you know, persecution, there has been times when God has supernaturally brought comfort and encouragement. So we had... Yeah, before you go on about yeah. that, I, I should tell anyone who this is perhaps the first video you've seen, we have an episode on this YouTube <clears throat> channel about um, uh, Muslims who are experiencing uh, a vision or a dream from uh, of Jesus where Jesus directly tells them where they can find the clear message of the gospel. And that happened to such a degree that in Egypt... Uh, missionaries, Christian missionaries were paying for ads <coughs> saying, have you seen the man in the white robe? He has a message for you. Contact us. So this is a well-known and well-documented phenomenon. So you've heard of stories like that too. And, and, Absolutely. and, and what else? What other things? Well, I get contacted every day by these individuals that are, are saying that, you know, we've had an encounter with Christ and uh, we need help. Uh, come to us and tell us what we do. What, we should, what, should, what should I do next? So we have a story of uh, Christians uh, and this is Christians who already become a Christian, and they would have to uh, hide Bibles uh, in in uh, you know pl places that you would not imagine that they would you know figure it out that this would be a safe place to stock up some Bibles. Like they would dig the walls and put the Bibles in the walls, oh and then you know, cover it up or put it under their bed. And sometimes when the security uh, agents discover that there is activity going on, either a home church or uh, an individual is practicing their faith or evangelizing, they would raid the place. And these people have to come up with all kinds of creative ways, you know, hide the Bibles under their bed. Some people hold boxes of Bibles uh, where the judge is usually not a civic judge, is a cleric who sits there and, you know, obviously he is uh, pro defending his own faith. He represents that faith. 
and they would accuse you. And in that system, unlike North America, where you're presumed innocent until proven guilty, it's the exact reverse. You're guilty, now try to prove to us that you're innocent. Wow. And the, uh, the burden is on you to try to prove your innocence rather than the prosecutor try to prove your guilt. So you're already guilty as you enter the court. And no matter what you say, they've already decided according to their constitution that you have become an apostate. And the crime for apostasy could vary anything from, uh, from uh, financial penalties to execution and anything in between. Most people get at least one or two years of prison terms, and sometimes they get a suspended prison term if they pay a financial penalty and they go under you know, house arrest or some other For having a box of Bibles. Having a box of Bibles. So uh, now if, if I was a, a Muslim in Iran and I became a Christian, and let's say that I've been dodging this. I, I've been a part of a house church, um, but I decided I, I've got to get out of here. I've got to get out of Iran. What would I do? Is that an easy process? Where do I go? How do I, how do, I do that? Well, it depends if they've already identified you as someone who uh, in their intelligence records has some kind of a uh, you know check mark as to whether you're an active Christian or not. If they haven't yet discovered you, uh, you know you have your passport and uh, you would apply for a I visa. Can go you can get out. Anywhere. You can get out. Yeah. Okay. Most likely, but if they've already identified as to who you are and they have a record on you, uh, they probably will not let you leave uh, through the normal channels. So a lot of these Christians who have either been interrogated or persecuted in some form, they would choose to escape through, you know, your uh, land borders, not even the official border, like through mountains and through deserts, find a way. And there's some local tribes people there that would probably <coughs> smuggle you across the border. But it's not simply getting in a truck and going to the other side, like you would have, let's say, U.S.-Mexico border. It's not like that. The, yeah. It is a very mountainous area, very dangerous, very hard. And there are guards that would shoot. And they wouldn't ask questions. They would see somebody trying to cross the border illegally. They would shoot the person. Yeah. So many people get killed in crossing the border. But it's a very harsh crossing. And uh, it takes not just a couple of hours. It takes a few days to be able to cross the border. So not easy. Yeah. Well, what I want people to understand here is that this is happening in today's world. I mean, I think sometimes in the West, we start to think, uh, you know, it's all like, it's, just, it's like we know it's bad in other places or it's different in some way, but I don't think we realize or appreciate the freedoms that we have. Um, that, that in today's world, there are people who are being persecuted for having a box of Bibles. And, uh, you know, I, I think uh, one of the things that comes to my mind when I think about this, and of course, we're Christians sitting here, the thing that, that is impressive to me is I see so many other non-Christian worldviews. And to some of you out there, this may sound offensive and I can't help it, but um, we're okay. Christians are okay with Qurans being around. Uh, uh, we're okay with uh, uh, having other uh, you know, atheistic literature and propaganda material. We're okay with this. And the reason is because we're not self-conscious about our Christianity. We believe that Christianity will do perfectly fine in the marketplace of ideas that compare it with any other worldview, we're going to be fine. But you find in uh, other worldviews to different extents, maybe not to the extreme that is going on with the Bibles in Iran, but an attempt to silence it, get it out of the public square, get it off people's minds, get it out of the country in this case. And uh, with Christianity, we're fine with, hey, I, I want my daughters to know what's in the Quran. I want my daughters to, to read the great you know, Bertrand Russell and, and things like that. So, well, Ed, I appreciate this and I've enjoyed it. And I hope that we can continue to work together to Absolutely. see uh, Christ brought to the Muslim world. Absolutely. Um,